Pickaxe. Welcome to The Review of Death, a Doctor Who podcast and your fortnightly home for Doctor Who news and reviews. I am Matthew Toffolo. Joining me from the other side of the planet is my good friend, Billy Garrett-John. How are you doing, Billy? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you very much, Pickaxe Week, for having us and doing this with us. It is nice to be acknowledged. (laughs) Yes, it's nice to be back because we did Pickaxe Week. Yeah. Last time, uh, so yeah. it's good to be back. Um, but for now, uh, we're talking about Doctor Who. Uh, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you're in the right place. If you don't know what mm. Doctor Who is or where to start, or maybe you're just like a person who's interested, but you, you're like, oh, this has been going on for 60 years. Where the hell do we begin with a show that big? Well, have no fear, because that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about where to start with Doctor Who. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're also going to talk about the recent Doctor Who poll results, where they've gone through every Doctor and looked at all their stories. And the the readers of Doctor Who magazine have voted for their favourites. So we're going to have a little discussion about that as well. But uh, first up, news. What's been happening in the world? You went to Bournemouth Comic Con. Uh, I did. Tell us all about that. Uh, it was good fun. Uh, I met. Colin Baker for the umpteenth time and Sylvester McCoy for the second time and uh, John Levine for the first time. I walked past Mandip Gill uh, a couple of times. And smelt uh, her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good fun. Um, yeah, we, good. Had, we, had, we had a good laugh. Uh, my brother got to meet Sylvester McCoy, dressed yeah. as Sylvester McCoy, and Sylvester McCoy was dressed as the seventh doctor as well. So, uh, yeah, it was just really, really good fun. It was very small, though. There was really? F all there to do. Yeah, it was a what showmaster's was like? event. It was this. So they had two things running at the same time. Some, obviously, the Comic Con, and then they had some like Lego convention running in mm. like the hall next door. But it was a big venue, but there was just nothing there. There was like barely any stalls. You, you literally, you walked in, and it was just like a few tables with the guests on it, a little area with a stage, and then. There was maybe like 10 tables of tat. And, you know, some of it really was just tat as well. There was not, Mm. you know, I thought I was going to be going there and be like, oh, you know, might pick up a Target novel or, you know, an annual or something just to mark the occasion. Didn't need to worry about that. I didn't spend any money. It was brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, there There were people like selling fucking scented candles and shit. I was no. like, come on. Most of the people oh here don't even know how to use normal soap, <laughs> let alone scented candles. <laughs> ah, it's sad, but it's true. <laughs> I remember going to um, Telford Comic Con before it became Wales Comic Con in England. Oh, yeah. I don't know what yeah, the fuck yeah. that's about. It's really and weird. I, went I don't there, like that. Uh, and it, Telford's a, 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 an odd place. It just seems to have a shopping centre. And then uh, got off the train walk towards Telford Convention Centre, which is like a really nicely kitted out venue. But why the yeah. fuck it's in Telford? I've got no idea. And um, uh, you could actually, you know, like in cartoons where you have the scent thing coming from the pie and the little yeah. character gets carried off his feet towards it. You could do that, but it was for B.O. That was the only way I could find <laughs> my way to the venue. It was amazing, you know. Um, but I'm glad you had a nice time. I'm sorry you didn't get yeah. to spend money. No, but we had, but there were some lovely there were some lovely people there who came up to yeah. me and said you know listen to the podcast a uh, nice chap called oh, James cool. who we met at Pandorica last year he came yes. over and said hello, hello he, said, James. I, he said I listen only on Spotify or on you know the audio version ah. uh, so nice to see you again James if you're listening um, and he said he gets all of his news from us, so I said we need to do more to make sure that our news is up to date. <laughs> well, okay, it's not like we're recording this. We're, I mean, we are recording this on the day it's going out. It, we're here live. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, okay, let's talk about some news that has occurred, roughly speaking. Um, yeah. Chris Chibnall uh, has done an oh, interview yeah. for a podcast called Who Corner to Corner, I believe. And I listened to it. Uh, on a, a wet commute back through Auckland. And maybe it was the weather that sort of tinted my expectations of it all or how I felt coming out of it. But I I would, I came out of it wanting to know more, which is good because there's a part two coming out. Yeah. But 
it was really interesting hearing him chat about how he viewed the show, making the show, the production, you know, the way that he interacted with marketing people. And he seemed reluctant to clue anybody in on what was going on, which mm. I think is fair to say that's something we've kind of been aware of or that has been, yeah. you know, rumoured. Um, but he was sort of, you know, I mean, did you, did you listen to the whole thing in the end? I, I haven't, no. Um, I, I just sort of looked at the cliff notes on Twitter. Yeah. He was basically sort Thanks, of saying... Thanks, <laughs> Cheers, Saris. Cheers, Saris. He was basically <laughs> so, saying about, you know, the secrecy in the show, you've got to be sure who you can trust, uh, you know, because I always think for a show like The Bear, which I think is going out on Disney yeah. Plus at the moment and is apparently very good, um, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to know what happens in a show like that. You want to be surprised when you watch it in the moment. Uh, so why would you tell anybody about anything that's coming up? And it's like, that was a very, very truncated way of, of, of how he put it. Yeah. But it's like, but Doctor Who isn't an ITV, a, a, a one-off ITV drama that might get no. recommissioned for a second series. It is yeah. a massive monolithic show and you have to have the right head on you to promote the program. And is it- from listening to that interview, I'm, you know, as a showrunner, as a, as a head writer, maybe, as a head writer, yeah. Chris Chibnall, grand. I really enjoyed the Chibnall Whitaker era. I know a lot of people didn't, but I did. Mm. Um, but I don't think. Did they have a brand manager? Like, I guess he's I not guess that they kind of showrunner, is he? No, and I was just about to say that. You know, this is it. It isn't a show, like you said. It's not like a drama, drama. You know, this is this is a brand. You know, mm. like it, love it or not. You know. That is just how it is these days. Um, and I mean, it was getting like that in the 80s. You know, John Nathan mm. Turner, he knew that Started there was that. more to be done. You know, yeah. Um, and it was just that the BBC couldn't see it for what it could potentially become. Um, mm. So it seems weird that then you'd have someone who literally grew up with Doctor Who at the time when it wasn't being treated well and then would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to, really treat it to its full potential. I mean, we're, no. we're kind of lucky in some ways that we got stuff like, we got all those different games, didn't we? We got the, the VR yeah. game that then became the PlayStation game. And there was that Weeping Angel mobile one. Um, there was the uh, interactive stuff. Like, to be fair, in terms of Doctor Who being a world you could enter into, I think that that era is going to be known for really branching out into the interactivity side, like video games or the yeah. escape rooms or the yeah. immersive theatre experiences yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, that VR stuff was happening right from Jodie's first series, that runaway yeah, experience yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, there was that as well, um, wasn't there? Yeah. It, it, it really, on the one hand, maybe the audience wasn't there to get these kind of books out and stuff like that yeah. people wanted to interact with. But actually... Maybe because it's special, we could do a video game. Maybe mm. because it's special, we could do a theatre experience. But yeah. we can't afford the lease on a fucking, you know, museum. But we can do yeah. these things. So, it, you know, it was effective in that way. But I think on screen, in terms of the promotion, in terms of the public being aware of what was going on and what the fans knew, um, we don't need to know everything. But we, I think probably it's fair to know a bit more than we did yes. at the time. Um, and I mean, it... it- it shows really in his first series, you know, at the end of the the woman who fell to earth, you know, rather than doing a trailer for the series, here is a trailer of all the guest actors. Bonkers. It's like, all right, some people are <clears throat> going to care about that, but the kids aren't going to give a shit because I tell you, who like, doesn't care about that? The fans who want to see what's coming up later, because we know yeah. all these people are going to be in it. We know Lee Mack is in this episode. We know Mark yeah. Addy is in this episode. Whatever it is. Um. That seemed to me to be, I can't remember who said it on Twitter, but, you know, and obviously he talks a lot about his time making Broadchurch um, yeah. and and he's got this showrunner course and a lot of people are going on to work on ITV dramas and stuff. But it was like Doctor Who was produced like an ITV drama. Yeah. Um, to the extent where they, f- you know, didn't front load it, but the, the trailer for the whole series, as you said, was here are the guest stars we've got in. And that's the only reason you'd watch an ITV drama is, oh, look, Mr. Mr. Bean is Prowo, whatever it is. You know, <laughs> it's the only reason you'd watch one of them. Um, yeah. Oh, here's Sheridan Smith in another dowdy, yeah. depressing, you know, slice of life drama. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. It was interesting, uh, but you're, you're right. It, it, I think 
he didn't have that head on him to run no. it as a brand. Um, yeah. uh, beyond that, some interesting stuff that came out of it. Um, there was going to be a Pating sequel called Pating's. That would have been um, great. That didn't I, happen. I would have yeah. I've been all there for that. That sounds good. It's because you don't like the Saranga conundrum, but you like the Pating. I think the Pating has got great potential. Um, so I think, yeah, if you'd have done a story with, you know, it would have been like Star Trek, Trouble with Tribbles, but... Yeah, Patings or Gremlins, isn't it? It's just going to be Gremlins with these little bastards. That would have cemented them more, I think, as like a all-time yeah. great villain. You know, not yeah. all-time great villain, but in terms of design and in terms of you could bring them back. They could be in group shots of villains, yeah, you know, and you be know. recognizable. Like they needed another story to cement that. Yeah, but it would it would have been good fun. You know, I, I imagine it'd have been sort of fairly farcical, but it would have been it oh, would yeah. have been a good laugh. Um, um, and you know, that's what you need sometimes. It wasn't always the plan for Mandit Gill to be a companion through the whole of Jodie's run. So interesting how that obviously sort of developed, I guess, over time. Yeah, uh, With weird. their chemistry on screen. Um, it Takes You Away was placed earlier in Series 11, which yeah. I thought was particularly interesting because for me, It Takes You Away is the finale of that series. Like I know that yeah. obviously Tim Shaw comes back uh, in the Battle of Ranskor of Kolos, which is the finale, quote unquote, that didn't feel like a finale. Um, yeah. but in terms of the thematic beats of that season, for me, the, the arc is Ryan and Graham and their relationship and how that develops. Yeah. Um, it's not quite as dynamic and exciting as Torchwood or Bad Wolf, <laughs> but, um, you know, that was, I think the strongest core running storyline through that season. Yeah, um, and it and it makes sense that you'd put that story at the end because yeah. if you have it early on, then it's like, well, the character development. There's no development. It's just it and also straight away. Grace appearing in that story. Spoilers. Yeah, uh, it's like, well, you know, she was only in it two or three weeks ago, or whenever it was placed. So yeah, that to me it was odd. Um, and also, yeah, so like in my head, in my head canon, it you know you could reorganize most of the running order of series eleven. I think it would make it a better viewing experience and i think it takes yeah. you away while not finale fodder if you knew that the next week you were going into the new year's um resolution special with the uh, dalek yeah. um i think that would have been a fine you know pre-season finale yeah. um yeah. anyway uh he can see how stuff like the murka happens this is chib saying uh monsters just not coming off i think this mm. was in relation to again from it takes you away the villain from that being cut oh, um yeah which I, I can't remember its name, but it was some sort of... Um, the foreskin weird, creature. The foreskin creature. He, he gave it a name in the <laughs> podcast, the and spindle, I can't remember what it was. Spindle or something? The Spindle Man, spindle or, something, man yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which looked cool. <laughs> foreskin <but>, um, <laughs> um Yeah, he got cut, and it looked cool, but, I, you know, he, interesting that he, he says there are things that are just out of your control that you just think, okay, that's going to look fine on the day, and then you get into the studio and it just doesn't work. And yeah. you try and make it work in the edit, and it just doesn't work for whatever reason. So it, lo- it um, looks all right in the pictures. Yeah, I it thought. may have been seeing it in motion or the way they shot it or something. You know, maybe it's like the the self loathing creature from Red Dwarf. Like it looks great, yeah, as a still. But I can see why when they got it in the studio, they were like, "We just have to film its fucking cast." Yeah. <laughs> and so did shadows. you know that that was originally the design of the Destroyer in Battlefield. From Doctor, Doctor Who. Who. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what the frig? That's so good. I'm so glad good. that they, they swapped, you know? Yes. I'm yeah, glad uh, the Destroyer looks yeah. the way he does. Uh, they wanted fully CGI sea devils for uh, the Legend of the Sea Devil story. Uh, thank which God the, that never it, happened. Thank God it didn't happen. That was also supposed to be just a straight pirate story. Um, no sea devils involved until it seems like what? the kind of last minute. What um, the fuck would the plot have been? Uh, <laughs> and described it as being like the Grand National, that story. You get round a corner and there was another hurdle. And I think of, of a lot of Doctor Who stories where you think, okay, I can see the production of this hasn't gone very well. That yeah. screams there's been mm. trouble. Um, yeah. Because the edit is all over the place. And I didn't yeah. fully appreciate that until uh, you and Johnny talked about it. Uh, for the yeah. podcast review last uh, last Easter, wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah. Because I watched it in a fucked up thing anyway. We mentioned earlier for new viewers, uh, I live in New Zealand. So last year I watched my first ever Doctor Who story in New Zealand and it was Legend of the Sea Devils, which 
is edited in the most incomprehensible fashion. But then yeah. to add on top of that, somebody who has watched Doctor Who as it should be watched without advert breaks on the BBC for my whole life <laughs> to then watch an international edit and they chisel fucking adverts into it where ad breaks don't exist. Yeah. Uh, it was even harder to keep a track on what was going on. And now working on that side of things, I can see how much material sometimes gets cut that is actually quite important to set this, the next scene up. You know, <laughs> it's not just a case of fade down and fade back up within half a millisecond. Oh, I was going to say, does this mean you might get to watch Doctor Who early for no, New Zealand it's broadcast, Disney Plus, but it's all no. on Disney Plus? Oh, no. you missed out. You might have been able got, to have um, watched the Legend of the Sea Devils early. Well, had, had you, have, had you I have don't know if, moved last year? I don't know year. if I want that. I don't know if I want no. that on me, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mentioned, because I, I got a thing sent around to my email, like, oh, here's three, que- pick three questions out of these 10 to introduce yourself to the team. And I wrote one about Doctor Who, obviously, because you have to have the, the token Doctor Who fan in the office. And I yeah. said, um, uh, gutted, you know, kind of gutted, I'm not going to be able to caption any of it, but looking forward to seeing what happens <laughs> on Disney Plus in the future. Because um, I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew that they weren't going to get Doctor Who back. Oh, really? Uh, on TVNZ. Yeah. Um, oh, shit. This is a very niche chat about. Nobody very told niche us. <laughs> Uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody told us, man. Uh, okay, so uh, next, uh, the Sun reports Ryan Gosling has been approached about a guest role in the oh, show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. This all stems from Shooty Gatwer apparently saying on the set of Barbie when Shooty was cast as Doctor Who, Ryan Gosling was like, "Oh my god, man, that's like my favourite show." Uh, which I can imagine he... him saying, dressed up as Ken. Yeah, he but he he he'd already. Uh, announced his love for Doctor Who because he cast Matt Smith, didn't he, in a in a film oh, that he directed? Um, in a terrible that didn't film, do very that well. didn't come out, or Matt got cut from, or some mad shit. Uh, no, I think he was in it. I just think it came out with very little fanfare, and okay. no one saw it. Um, okay. That was the one that he shaved his head for, I think. Yeah, he played like some hard hard man in it. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you remember the trailer for that? He was like. He had a shaved head and he was, was he sort of like... Was he wearing like a vest or something? He was yeah, like, he looked sort quite of, swole. Sort of like topless, but not yeah. topless. And I got yeah. like, he was sort of, wasn't he dancing around like that? Or am I getting it confused with Morbius? I don't know. Either oh, way. Oh God, I haven't seen Morbius yet. I've not seen Morbius yet and I never will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not unless my life hits rock bottom. And I, I, reckon, I, t- I reckon we should watch it because it has got Matt Smith in it. Oh, Christ, come on. No. That's a commentary <laughs> for the Patreon. Oh, a, if you don't know, oh. we have a Patreon. We do commentaries for Doctor Who things. We talk about other Doctor Who things. It's worth it. And maybe, maybe more will come up Maybe some we'll point. do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he was already a fan. That's why he cast Matt Smith, because he'd saw Matt Smith in Doctor Who and was like, wow, right. this is a great show and he's a great guy. So he, he yeah, you, you know, he's got previous as a Doctor Who fan. Um, whether or not he's going to be in Doctor Who, no, I, I doubt it. But hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all up for being wrong. I'm all up for being wrong. Did we know about? I'm trying to think about high-profile stars that came in. Did we know about Kylie before it was officially announced? I know Kylie's not quite on the same level as Ryan Gosling, but you know, no. Um, but I guess back then, back in 2008 or seven, whenever it was, she mm. probably was. You know, she was. She was still producing music uh, yeah, with true. regularity then, wasn't she? True. Um, and she was still doing stuff like uh, X Factor and Britain's Got Talent yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I guess she was doing that sort of stuff. Or was that Danny? Oh, no, that was, that, that, no, that that was Danny. Danny. Oh, dear. Um, poor, poor Manoogs. Yeah, the Manoogs. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'd be happy for Ryan Gosling to turn up. Yeah, but I don't why think, not? I don't think I mean, that I think they should do it. They should treat big stars like him, the way that they're treated in the Star Wars films, like Daniel Craig being in The Force Awakens. Yeah. And just stick him in a fucking Stormtrooper outfit. And yeah. but then I love that scene because I always watch it and I can't watch it and not go, that's Daniel Craig, that's Daniel Craig, that's Daniel Craig. Because yeah. they used his voice and he yeah. sounds like a, he sounds like fucking Daniel Craig as a Stormtrooper. <laughs> but all the other ones, like Prince Harry, didn't wasn't Prince Harry or Prince William in it as a Stormtrooper? And... Uh, you know, yeah. like Simon Pegg and uh, all, all the kind of major big celebs that were in the area at the time basically came yeah. in. Yeah, Tom Hardy did one. Tom Hardy. And he got, but he got cut. Ah, oh, poor yeah. Tom Hardy. 
Because I think he slapped, he, he slapped, slapped Finn's, is his name Finn? John yeah. Boyega. He slapped his ass or something in the scene. Okay. And it was, it was meant to be like, you know, military camaraderie sort of stuff. But maybe they just thought this is a bit weird. <laughs> maybe Disney were like, hmm. Because you know yeah. what, we know what Disney you thinks You know what about we know Disney things. can be like, yeah. Anyway, mm. where to start with Doctor Who, Matthew? This is the yeah. central crux of today's podcast. We are going to be trying to introduce the not we to Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, maybe we should start off by saying where we started. I started with my dad being a fan back in the yep. day. And then... Um, I watched Doctor Who Night 1999 with him, which was a whole evening of, you know, programs surrounding Doctor Who, about Doctor Who. Yeah. And I fell in love with it. Bang, there we go. Overnight, I'm a Doctor Who fan. And it yeah. hasn't changed since. Yeah. And my family did a really, really, I mean, some would say good job. Some would say bad job of making me a Doctor Who fan. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't think that's something that you can get done for uh, when you know, with social services, but it probably should be something they look into at some point, you know, is indoctrinating children into sci-fi franchises. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was my story, Matt. How did you get into it? It was your brother, wasn't it? It was my brother. Yeah. So obviously we both grew up, we both got into Doctor Who during the wilderness years, the wilderness years, um, which is the, the period of Doctor Who where it wasn't on the television because it was off air for 16 years. Uh, and I, I was born in 92. He'd grown up, at the tail end of Doctor Who, before it got cancelled in 89, he'd watched all of Sylvester McCoy's time as the Doctor. And I was born in 92 and just born into a house where Doctor Who was always on the telly. Doctor Who toys were around. Doctor Who books were around. I, I couldn't move for Doctor Who. And there was there was no escaping it, you know. Um, while my dad tried to get me into Catholicism, my brother more successfully got me into <laughs> Doctor Who. <laughs> they are two very similar churches to a degree. Yeah, um, a lot of dressing up uh, and funny hats. A lot of believing in <laughs> nonsense, a lot of yeah. uh, missing material, uh, some scandal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. so uh, yeah, that was me, really. So we were, we, we were 90s boys, aren't we? 90s boys. So it's kind of difficult for us to, I think, objectively, you know, recommend Doctor Who because we grew up at a point where we already knew a lot about the show before it came back and maybe that yeah. coloured our opinion of it at the time. Yeah. We've obviously gone through, uh, you know, our own sort of journey with rediscovering and reappreciating that era yeah. of Doctor Who, um, uh, being 2005 to now. And yeah. when we asked online um, where people should start, I have to say I'm incredibly disappointed by the number of completely wrong shit answers <laughs> that we received from people. <laughs> So we've always said, if you're yeah. interested in getting into Doctor Who, for the love of God, go nowhere near the classic series until you're ready. Because yeah. not only is that a huge, you know, chunk of the program's history that is very difficult to penetrate, um, yeah. just generally from a, like a law perspective. Uh, yeah. If you're not used to watching uh, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s television productions. Yeah. Uh, British television dramas, as well. British television, especially. Yeah. It is impenetrable for some people and it yeah. will put you off because, yeah. you know, it, it, whether it's the pace, whether it's the music, whether it's the sets, whether it's the some of the performances, because, you know, it's a bit more theatrical, it's staged a bit more like a play. A yeah. lot of those stories, especially in the 1960s and the early 1960s, were performed from beginning to end like a play with live camera cuts in the studio with very minimal yeah. special effects and any of that mm. kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, it's no, it's no good going into it thinking, oh, well, I like old Star Trek, so I'll probably like old Doctor Who. You know, even old Star Trek, it feels like a world away from the Doctor Who that was going out at the same time. Um, absolutely. So, so, yeah, you know, I, I sort of mentioned to my brother that we were going to be doing this today, and he was like, oh, yeah, well, I'd probably start with the John Pertwee or Tom Baker years. I was like, yeah, I mean, maybe if you're already into old telly, Possibly, yeah. But if you're not, I mean, as obviously, and you're not fans, into Doctor Who, and you're not into Doctor Who, that might not be the best place. And he was like, "Well, it works no. for us." I was like, "Yeah, but we were weird, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we're not children of the 21st century." Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think really, I always say the best place to start is with the new series, 
and start with Christopher yeah. Eccleston as it came back in 2005 with the very first episode, Rose, because it just introduces all the concepts in just the, the best possible way, really. I think that, you know, you're approaching this show in a, in a modern TV perspective where sometimes shows come with a caveat that, okay, you had to watch all of the previous week's stories to get it. Yeah. Right. I don't think that's always the case for Doctor Who, but I can understand nope. there are certain circumstances where that is the case. If there is yep. a, uh, a series long arc um, yep. where, okay, it maybe would be more satisfying if you'd watch the previous four stories to get all the clues or to get the little references. But really, Doctor Who was always created around the idea, or maybe it wasn't always created from the be- beginning like this, but it has always sl- slipped into this thing of, you could tune in any week and get a completely different story from what you had the week before. I think that is much more palatable for an audience now with the fact that you only have 45 minutes and then you're off somewhere else the next week. Whereas if you're watching some classic stories uh, and you are saddled with a story for four to six weeks, Mm. uh, sometimes longer. Yeah. uh, And they are short episodes, but again, if you're not used to the pace of old television, it can be really difficult to, yeah. you know, maintain your sanity. Uh, you know, I struggle. <laughs> I struggle oh, with yeah, we, any we Doctor Who do. story that is, you know, any longer than four parts. And usually from the 60s, I struggle with. Yeah. Um, they are not my go-to stories to watch. And they yeah. shouldn't be the first story that you watch. So we saw no. a lot of people saying, uh, we've got one here. Uh, uh, yeah, somebody saying we should we'd be starting with an unearthly child. That is the very first Doctor Who story of all time. For historical reasons, probably would be interesting to go back and watch it, but make sure you're oh, a Doctor yeah. Who fan first, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's very much it. Uh, interesting to watch when you're a fan, um, which is how I saw it. Uh, you know, I, was, I can remember being so excited getting to watch the first episode because I had yeah. no real idea of what it was like. Um and that's a four-part serial um, or story. Uh, and the first part is great, really good. You know, a lot of mystery. It sets everything up. It's weird, wonderful 60s telly. Yeah. The, the next three episodes, oh boy, is just grunting and gr- grumbling from cavemen for <laughs> three 25-minute episodes. That is hard going. I can remember mm. the disappointment was quite palpable when I watched it. I was like, oh my God, what is this? Um, to, you know, to the point where some might say how it managed to survive beyond those first four weeks is quite something. But then they introduced well, the Daleks and... and there that, you go, exactly. That's, that um, saved it. But, and um, I believe if I, if I consult the, the great review of death schedule planner... I yeah. believe later this year, as we approach the 60th anniversary, we're going to be doing an Unearthly Child. So, wow. Well, I mean, it um, makes sense. It does make sense. So for you Doctor Who fans who are going to become, you know, non-Doctor Who fans who are going to become huge fans uh, entirely through listening to this podcast and take our <laughs> advice and you hold off on watching an Unearthly Child for a couple of months uh, after binging Doctor Who on your streaming service of choice, illegal yeah. or illegal, you know, you know, let us know what you think <laughs> when we come round to it eventually uh, later in the year. Uh, I've got some other suggestions here. So as, as we said, yes, I mean, I think Rose, undoubtedly, that is where yeah. you start. Series one, episode one, 2005, Christopher Eccleston. But what's quite nice is that obviously with the format of Doctor Who being the lead actor changes every, you know, four or five years. Yeah. It does mean there are a couple of other jumping on points. Yeah. Uh, which people have recommended too. Uh uh, one here, of course, series five, episode one, the eleventh hour. Matt Smith's first story is the eleventh Doctor. Yeah, I think that works. If, if you want to watch something that is not quite two thousand and five in terms yeah. of production budget, yeah. visual effects, all that sort of stuff, then that is a really good way of starting. Um, I will put this up for debate. Say whatever you want to say about it, Matt. But I will suggest the woman who fell to earth, series eleven, episode one. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, because. Sure. It, it's a it's a decent regeneration story, yeah. and also it's the most recent regeneration story that you can watch with a brand new yeah. Doctor. Oh, very much so. Because I was thinking this, I was like, well, you know, you could sort of say the pilot with Capaldi, but there's too much in that series that harks back to other stuff. But series I eleven, agree. 
you know, lo- love it or hate it, at least it does start with a complete new slate and a breath of fresh air. Um, so that yeah. would be a possible in uh, for for fans. I've got some uh, suggestions here from Twitter. So factory employee, what a name, says, uh, I started... I, I might have to beat that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Uh, that was bleeps, but that's fine. Uh, I started with nine and haven't watched uh, anything previous. I'm in love with it and I'm seeing it through to the end. So that's somebody who has already started their journey in Fantastic. Doctor Who. This sounds wow. fucking religious when I say it like this. Selling it yeah. to you is a bloody, you know, way of life. Um, join the cult. <laughs> it's like, join the cult. Uh, that's somebody who is currently on their journey through Doctor Who and they started yeah. with Eccleston and they're going to be going back to the classic series at some point. Don't rush yeah. into it. Enjoy no. the show. Yeah. Um, Yoda, this is, this, is, this is their screen name on Twitter, so I'm going to read it like this. Um, mm, start on the new Doctor, I suggest. <laughs> um, if that is good for you. Uh, <laughs> what, what, was that was good? It, that was good. That was really good. Uh, I couldn't have done it better myself. Um, so do they, do they mean start with Shuji Gatwa? I would imagine Christmas. so. Okay. Yeah. I think that's probably a good place to start because the 60th yeah. anniversary is probably going to hark back a fair yeah. amount. It's going to be paying a lot of tribute to the show from 2005 onwards. So, you know, kind of recent past. Yeah. But I also think because it's the 60th anniversary, there's going to be a lot of other things that are coming into the mix. Some yeah. stuff like alternative media, which we have, we won't touch on here, but, you know, comic books, audio dramas, yeah. uh, novels, uh, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of Doctor Who yeah, uh, not just on television. That is also really worth looking at. But we're starting off with the TV series here. Yeah. Um, L L Cliff J says, "Death to the Daleks: A Bridge to BBC VHS." Same <laughs> place I started. Well, I have Very to agree. Good. Death to the Daleks is a banger, uh, it is but a banger. probably not a great place to start your journey. Uh, Reese says, "I'd probably start from the pilot." So we were just talking about this one, series yep. ten, episode one. Uh, yep. Series 10 introduces audiences to all the important stuff and gives them the option to go back later and re-watch the rest. Yeah. Um, would you uh, suggest the pilot over Deep Breath? Yeah, because Deep Breath's crap. <laughs> yeah. Deep Breath is Peter Capaldi's first story. That's Series 8, Episode 1. Yeah. Uh, his character goes through quite a dramatic shift in tone. Yeah. Uh it's so weird talking about Doctor Who to somebody who doesn't understand what Doctor Who is. I know, is. it's when weird, you put it into it? context like this, um, yeah. he I, goes I through quite other- a dramatic shift in tone. So, uh, you know, the pilot is the most palatable version of his character. And yes. as Matt said, his actual debut story isn't as strong as this very, very soft reboot for the series. I mean, the fact that yeah. it's even called the pilot is an indication of what they're going for there. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, t- you know, tongue-in-cheek way of approaching it. Yeah, I think with Deep Breath as well, it's it's too long, and I think too much at the mm. beginning. He's not even in it, and it's just waffly wank going on with other characters that has really no place anywhere else in the story. It just feels like it's just filling time for the sake of filling time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the pilot isn't a, necessarily a bad shout. Yeah, waffly wank, do do. David Mitchell <laughs> says. Timey wimey, start where you start and find your way there. Though you'll be f- taking the long way home, it's about time travel after all. And like I said, I Did think you say that's David not a Mitchell? bad way. <laughs> David Mitchell, not the David Mitchell. <laughs> I, <laughs> thought you were going to, I thought you were going to say it like this. Start Jeremy. where you start and find your way there. Um, I uh, I think that is a very good way of approaching it. I had yeah. never really considered. I mean, but then also. You think of the way that we would have started watching Classic Who. Yeah. If it wasn't for a TV listing in, um, you know, the local TV listing magazine to see what was going to be on UK Gold that weekend or whatever. Yeah. Which you may have already had some prior knowledge of thinking, oh, it's the Sea Devils this weekend. I haven't seen that one before or whatever. Yeah. That's supposed to be good. I know what they look like. But mm. to take it from, go on BBC iPlayer or your streaming service of choice, wherever you are internationally. Yeah. And just look at the episode synopsis. And provided you're not, at the thick or the thin end of a season. Yeah. Like a middle episode somewhere there. Anything that takes your fancy. I mean, like Blink. Blink is not an introductory story. The Doctor yeah. is not really in it. Um, but it's a really good introduction to the way that Doctor Who plays with horror convention and the yeah. kinds of villains you can get in the show that are kind of genre and time bending and stuff like that. Um, 
What other kind of middle of the season random, you know, bits of gold are there? I mean, I was going to say, in terms of Blink, you know, it worked with my other half. She watched Blink with no knowledge of what Doctor yeah. Who was. It freaked her out. She thought it was great. Then she went off and watched all of the new series from Christopher Eccleston onwards. And then she was like, right, this is great. And then went back to the 60s and was mad and went that all is the way through she, it. That is where she lives now. Like, you know, yeah. uh, although she is a fan of Doctor Who as a whole, uh, yeah. she is a 1980s Fifth Doctor stan. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. that is her era. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, similar to my other half, although she doesn't give a shit about Doctor Who, um, <laughs> she uh, she couldn't care less about Doctor Who in the 60-year sense of it, right? Yeah. You know, she tolerates it. She likes the books. She likes the artwork. You know, she likes going, oh, that looks cute. What's that monster? That's as far as it goes. And we yeah. will watch Doctor Who together, but only the modern stuff. She can't, you know... I can't remember the last time we watched anything classic where we sat down and she actually watched the whole thing. But uh, anyway, she got into it through Jodie Whittaker. Yeah. And she really liked Jodie Whittaker's tenure on the show. She liked that whole series. She would catch up on it on episodes that we weren't able to watch together. She would watch it in her own time. Now, that wow. is an indicator of somebody who's actually enjoying My God. whatever they're being forced through watching. Um, so... <laughs> She started what, with that, so that is... What, what hostage situation did you put her in for that? <laughs> I've only ever had to, like... When have I ever had to be like, right, we have to sit down and watch... It would have been for the podcast when we were living back in Bristol. And it yeah. probably would have been something like, oh, God. It would have been an 80s story, you know? Yeah. It would have been something I wouldn't have minded so much that she was going to sit there and watch. It might have been a sylve or something. Yeah. Um, God, bless her heart. Oh, uh, no, maybe it was a Davison. <laughs> Um, right. Although, if we have to suggest any classic stories for people to dip into if they enjoy the new series, where would you suggest people start with the classic series, Matt? Um, I think Spearhead from Space is a really good one because yeah. that is a very good jumping on point because that in itself is a bit like a soft reboot for the show. Yeah, it's season seven, doc- episode one. It's John Pertwee's first story. Um, it's the first story in colour as well. So if black and white mm-hmm. sort of puts you off a bit, this is a really good... Uh, a really good one and it was all shot on film so it looks stunning it is, amazing especially yeah. in, in HD if you can find a nice um, I don't know where it streams uh, where you can watch it in HD Britbox I guess on Britbox yeah I mean it's it's yeah. the, the nicest looking old episode of Doctor Who for that reason um, so that's a really good one um, I guess you know anything with like early Tom Baker stories because they are very much like you were saying, they're very much secluded, really, unless it's in his first season. But, you know, Pyramids of Mars is my favourite Doctor Who story. I think you can mm-hmm. stick that on and get a real sense of what this show is trying to do. Um, yeah. Or maybe something like Remembrance of the Daleks, which is a that fantastic... That was the one that I wrote down. Yeah. yeah. I think whenever I've had, like, friends captive and thought, right, you know, well, let's watch an old Doctor Who, that is the one that I always go to. Uh, and they go, like, to, they go wanna... for the doors. They're trying to the door handles rattling, and you're like, "I've bolted it." And they they turn around and they see me with a key like that, going like, "Yeah, dropping it in my mouth." Uh, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to wait. Whenever... Me to shit this out onto the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not having chicken wings tonight, so you're not gonna see that for a while. Um, yeah, I, I mean, remembrance was the one that I wrote down because I think it is. I think some people have described it as sort of like the closest you'll get to like a Michael Bay directing Doctor Who back in the classic series because it yeah. is, you know, Megan Fox turns up and takes a bra off. No, it's like, you know, explosions <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> it's like explosions left, right and centre. Yeah. Um, Daleks being blown to bits. You know, it's it's cool. It's a cool story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. You get, you know, a big returning villain. I won't spoil it, you know, but you get a big returning villain and you get some... You know, one of the best actors, you know, to play the Doctor, who really at the time wasn't given his flowers, and now you get to yeah. go back and watch Sylvester McCoy as Doctor Who and go, he's really good. Yeah. Um, so forget what anybody's told you about, oh, it went rubbish towards the end of the 80s. It did, and then it got really good, and then it yeah. finished right at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What about black and white episodes to start people on? Obviously, we mentioned um, An Unearthly Child. Um, 
I mean, I think something like Tomb of the Cybermen is very good because it introduces yeah. a, it, in, it sort of introduces a new companion and it's got an old monster. It comes up with this um, one, one of the big conventions of the 60s is the base under siege story where you basically have a load of people trapped somewhere and the monsters are outside trying to get in. Uh, and so th it's very much like that. So it will introduce you to that convention. It features my favorite monsters, these buggers over my shoulder, the Cybermen. Yeah. Um, I mean, even Earthshock. Earthshock is another good one to watch. Earthshock would definitely be good to watch. Um, that is what this Cyber and, Leader is from. Yeah, the, 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 the best Cyberman story ever, I think. Um, yeah. Earthshock is just amazing. It's very good. Um, I excellent suppose in terms of indeed. those bit excellent. I suppose in terms of those big stories from the classic series that might be worth looking at if you're like, right, okay, which are the big, the big stories to tune in for? Earthshock yeah. is definitely one of them. Um, that's from the Fifth Doctor's era. Genesis of the Daleks. We were talking oh, about yeah. the the Fourth Doctor earlier. That yeah. is a six part story, uh, which they can be difficult to to get through. I struggle yeah. with them, but it's probably Doctor Who's best ever six part story. Yeah, um, it, it and we, zooms we, by for me. We reviewed it a few weeks back, very we? recently, um, yeah. Um, yeah. and yeah, we 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 just sang its praises all the way through. Yeah, the Five Doctors as well. Something else we spoke about recently. Yeah, uh, that is the twentieth anniversary story. So if you've sampled a bit from each Doctor and you fancy seeing them come together for the original Avengers team up, that yeah. is the one. Uh, all the Doctors. Uh, Minus one who had, who, who had passed away and they recast him. Uh, but and minus that, another who couldn't be asked to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> minus another one who, to <laughs> the press call for the story, sent his Madame Two Swords waxwork. Yeah. So it's just uh, sometimes when you're explaining Doctor Who and what a mad show it is, when you just boil it down to the explanations like that, you think, what a fucking weird TV show <laughs> this is. And what a weird bunch of people who are in it as well. Um, uh, great stuff. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so next up is something that might help you a little bit on your journey, but really yeah. this is for um, this is for Doctor Who fans who want to vent and frustrate, uh, get frustrated about stories they like not being given their flowers. So yeah. um, Doctor Who magazine have conducted a 60th anniversary poll in which yeah. uh, at the moment all we know are the rankings for each individual Doctor. Um, there is going to be uh, a, a full list, list of every single story ever published in one big uh, uh, ranking. But yep. at the moment, they have just done it for individual doctors. So we're going to go through those. And then, of course, because that's what the Review of Death was founded on, is us moaning about shit like this. Um, we're going to go through the full list when it get, gets published towards the end of this year. Yeah. Uh, but on the stream, we thought we would discuss these. Now, Matt. Remind me, it was uh, all done online and it was out of 10, these stories were rated, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, they gave you every episode for each Doctor. Uh, they did two Doctors a month and you had to, get out of 10, rate each story. Um, so yeah, this might be helpful for people who, you know, if you're looking for what, what are considered the best Doctor Who stories as voted by yeah. fans, this might help you if you're thinking, well, well, maybe I'll try an old Doctor. Let's see what this is like. We'll comment Definitely. on them because some of them we might be like, Phew, that's impenetrable, like the war yeah. games, um, <laughs> as, which is superb, a superb story, but it's 10 episodes long. It's all in black and white. If you've never watched black and white telly before, you might yeah. die. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so okay. we'll, we'll, we'll start off with the, with the main man, the gaffer yeah. himself, William Hartnell, William Billy Hartnell himself. Mm, so, indeed. So top stories. Um, Let's well, do the top three, and should we do the top three and the bottom three? We'll comment yeah, on those. I think so. And then so. any ones we see in the middle that we're like, why is that so low? We can just bring up really quickly. Yeah. So um, a story we actually reviewed earlier this year came in at mm. number one, uh, which I was surprised at. I can't say the Dalek Invasion of Earth. It is a great story. It is better than the Daleks' first story. Yeah. Um, in fact, looking a little bit further down this list, I can see that the Daleks, the original Dalek story in which they're introduced, uh, the second ever episode of Doctor Who comes in fifth, which um, I suppose is only there for posterity. The fact it's the first ever Dalek story because it is a slog, yeah. uh, that first Dalek story, and is told much better 
in Technicolor with Peter Cushing as Doctor Who for the yeah. Doctor Who uh, movies, which again, if you're not that keen on watching these TV versions, those adaptations might be a nice way to start Yeah, uh, with an introduction to the Daleks because yep. uh, both Dalek Invasion of Earth and the Daleks are six-parters. Um, so again, might be a bit difficult to, to crack into if you're not used to watching that. So yep. yeah, in first place, Dalek Invasion of Earth. I have to say... Uh, it's not my favourite first Doctor story, but I no. I can understand it being number one. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, I, I I'm quite surprised that it's number one, to be honest. But I guess, like you said, it's a Dalek story. It's it's probably the best surviving Dalek story from his era. Um, yeah. Dalek Master Plan came in at number three. Uh, this is a story that only exists in parts because a lot of old 60s Doctor Who was junked by the BBC. Why did they do that? Well, why do Disney Plus remove stuff from their streaming service mm. without telling anyone so you can't watch it ever again? Times haven't changed. It's crazy, but there we but go. unlike what the Doctor Who team or the BBC did at the time, <laughs> they didn't fucking delete the file and then burn the hard drive. <laughs> No. Round the back in a fucking skip, which is what they <laughs> yeah. did back then. So these stories are gone visually. A lot of these yeah. stories are missing. Um, there are animated reconstructions. We have the audio for every single story, uh, and sometimes which is people, very, very lucky. clever people, very which lucky, is very lucky, because some some shows from the nineteen sixties and even the seventies don't yeah. even have that. So yeah. we're very lucky that we can actually listen to this stuff. Which is a massive thanks to everybody who ever held a microphone up to a tiny little speaker in front yeah. of the TV or jury, their parents or by jury in the rigged way. their tape recorder into the back of their telly risking Literally. fatal electric shocks <laughs> they did it for us yeah. Um, but yeah a lot of these stories don't exist but uh, as we said the, the top two do so Dalek Invasion yeah. of Earth number one as you said Dalek's Master Plan is third but in second place the Time Meddler which correct me if I'm wrong has always been at the top of those polls for the First Doctor um, so yeah, so last time in 2014, it was number five. So it's always ah. been in the top five. In 2009, it was number eight. So it was wow. much further down the list. And then in 1998, it was number 12. Wow. So it has so gone up in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, it is my favorite William Hartnell story, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, that and the Aztecs are two of my favorite William Hartnell stories, but I think Time Meddler wins just a little bit more. Um, it's uh, notable because it is the first time the Doctor, the Doctor who is a Time Lord, if you didn't know, um, meets another of his own race uh, who also has a TARDIS. So you can only imagine that for audiences back in 1964 or whenever that aired, they were mm. like, what the frigging hell is going on here? There's another one. Holy shit. So Minds it, it's are being blown. Yeah, and it's a pure historical um, otherwise, um, yeah. which was the case for a lot of old Doctor Who, was that stories wouldn't have any monsters in or any sort of real sci-fi elements. It would just be, they go back in time, they get caught up in historical events, and they've got to get themselves out of it. So the bottom three are the Sensorites at number yeah. 27, the Space Museum at number 28, and in last place, the Web Planet. I mean... <laughs> Uh, I don't agree with the sense rights being that low. No. I like the sense rights. It's seven episodes. It is a bit of a slog. It does go on for a bit, but I actually do rather enjoy it. I think it's a, it's a, mm. it's a good concept. It's a bit too long. Web Planet is shit. <laughs> <laughs> Rewatched it earlier in the year because it came out on Blu-ray as part of the season two box set. My God, that mm -hmm. is like having teeth pulled. It, it really is. Or I would rather go to the dentist, actually, and I'm terrified of the dentist. Yeah, well, there we go. I, I went to the dentist the other day. I've got a new dentist, and he was lovely. There's a man called Bjorn. Oh, yeah. He's from Germany. Yeah. He is literally <laughs> up the road from where I live. Very nice yeah. man. Yeah. He's, I, I said that we have a Doctor Who podcast, and he was like, oh, yeah. He said, there's some very good actors in Doctor Who, yeah? I said, yeah, yeah. He He's said, never who's seen your favourite? He's never seen it. <laughs> who's your favourite? Uh, Tom Baker. Oh, yeah, Tom Baker, yeah. Mm, yes. 
Oh yeah, yeah with with the big hat and the long scarf, <laughs> and yeah, and the scarf, yeah. Uh, he had a he had a poster of the Simpsons, you know that famous poster of the Simpsons, which is all the characters. Oh that yeah, was, that was stuck on the ceiling um, above the chairs, you know, to amuse the kids. Um, it we amused to, we me. To distract them as they were having the the strongest part <laughs> of their body pulled out of their face. Yeah, I mean, I was just out there going, oh yeah, that's uh, that's that guy from that episode. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I've seen that one. Um, yeah, so yeah, good fun. Anyway. <laughs> and what did you have done, Matt? Why don't you just tell us the whole hug? <laughs> oh, I mean, it was just because I, d- I joined the surgery. So it was just a general ah, okay. sort of checkup. Um, they did put some like super glue shit on two of my teeth at the back. Uh, oh, because yeah. he said, oh, there's a, a little bit bit of decay there and there's a split. Yeah. So you might want a bit of sealant on it. That will be 20 pounds per tooth. So that's two teeth. That's 40 pounds. I was like, right, okay, fine. I'll, I'll have that done if it saves my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of shit we talk about. Uh, yeah. yeah. So as you said, we're planet. Yes, I agree. That being so far down the bottom. And if you want to have uh, your own Doctor Who experience at the dentist, I suggest watching The Gunfighters, where Doctor Who uh, goes back in time to get his root canal sorted out. Now, that is what I wanted to start with. In terms of our discussion of stories, why is that so low? 21, The Gunfighters. That is a brilliant episode of Doctor Who. It's great. It's, it's great. I don't know why it's that low. That's that's it's it's good fun. It's good fun. Very disappointing. Um, around that uh, as well, number twenty two, the savages. I'm very shocked to see that low, because yeah. I feel like that is starting to have a bit of a renaissance in terms of people going back and going four part William Hartnell. It's fucking decent. You know what yeah. I mean? It's. I, um, I I mean this is a missing episode, so I reckon if it existed, mm, I think it would be much much higher. Yeah. It's just one of those unfortunate things that <clears> because it's sort of fairly inaccessible at the moment. I mean, if it gets animated or something, yeah. I would love to see what the polls look like when we do it in 10 years' time. Uh, also on this list that I'm a bit shocked by, uh, 17, The Edge of Destruction, which yeah. out of the first three episodes of Doctor Who, I think is the best out of those first three. It's only two episodes do long. You? Uh, yeah. Oh my God, I love The Edge of Destruction. It is good. Uh, it's wacky. It's wacky, it's bonkers, and there is a, a one of my favourite ever scenes in the show is right at the end where William Hartnell is on his own in the console room and he's yeah. talking about the Big Bang and the formation yeah. of the universe and all that sort of stuff. I think is just one of the coolest bits of 60s Doctor Who. Um, yeah. He does it so well it, as well. He does it so well. It's probably one of his best bits of acting in the show. Uh, yeah. It's quite cerebral. It goes to some pretty strange places, yeah. but... If you want a Doctor Who story from that period in time that takes a bit of a sideways glance at sci-fi and maybe yeah. isn't all just aliens and back in time, that is definitely a good one to go for, I think. Yeah. And like you said, it's short. It's two episodes. Yeah. You know, very easy to, to digest. Um, I think otherwise, yeah, I, I, I think it seems pretty fair Yeah, looking at the list. Yeah. Um, what would Nothing. you have as number one? What's your favourite William Hartnell story? Well, 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 I said it would have been it would have been the Time Meddler, yeah. And I think that was yeah. the one that I voted the highest. Um, yeah, there's not really anything on here that I mean. I love that the fact that the that Galaxy Four has gone down compared to previous <laughs> years after it was animated because everyone watched it was like, this is crap. <laughs> it is shit. It is it shit. Is shit. Um, <laughs> I, I love the Aztecs. That's my favourite William Hartnell story. Yes, and, and I'm glad um, so that that's to see in the it, top five. Yeah, yeah, in the top five is is really cool. Okay, so let's have a look at the second Doctor. So uh, this is an interesting one because, I mean, obviously there are fewer stories. And when you look at it listed like this, you think, God, he had such a small run. But they yeah. were, you know, hugely important stories in the pantheon of Doctor Who. I think this is where Doctor Who goes from being, you know, a Saturday night show to fill a gap in the schedule. And although arguably it did hit some pretty bumpy times with ratings and sort of public opinion around this time. Yeah. Um, I think this is where the show comes into its own and finds its stride as a yeah. sci-fi series. So uh, uh, the, the top three, the war games, which is uh, the, the final story for Patrick Troughton as the doctor. That's yeah. 10 parts. As Matt said, probably best to steer clear of that for a little while. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's it's a fantastic story uh, because it does a very good job of keeping the story flowing over 10 weeks, mm. which seems like an impossible task, but somehow Malcolm Hulk and Terence Dix 
the writers pull it off um and it, 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 it's it. great yeah. uh, and it introduces the doctors uh people the time lords um and yeah it, it's uh it's a bit of a monumental story just in terms of the law of the program it sets up a lot of stuff um Big time. so i i i think it is it number one for me, I w- no, I, I wouldn't say no, N- no. But it's it's certainly up there. But I wouldn't say it was number one. Then at number two, we have the story that I would have put at possibly number one: Tomb of the Cybermen, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Brilliant! It's just uh, an all-round classic. Um, it was missing for years. It came back in 1992 when I was a wee bab, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it, it's great. It was one of the first black and white Doctor Who stories I watched, and I bloody loved it when I was you know, in nappies. So, yeah. I think uh, people who were fans of the show uh, before us who only heard the audio for this story yeah. prior to the vid- visuals arriving, they appear to have that taint their expectations or their opinions of this story because I think, I- I've certainly heard from older fans uh, that the visuals were a letdown compared yeah. to the audio. Yeah. Uh, but... I I don't see that at all. I no. think that especially when you look at the film sequences and some of the model work. Yeah. Um it is so well paced for a story from that time. Yeah. Um it's got so much atmosphere for a story where the characters that the, the main villains, the Cybermen, tend not to get very atmospheric stories. Yeah. Um Earthshock does, but it feels doom laden, you know, it doesn't feel sort of like it's got loads of you know, like the, the, the muse on Sen in this story is so cool. Like you're in an yeah. underground, frozen hive full of Cybermen, and it feels like it. It's great. It's really well realized for the time. Yeah. Uh, and that, and, and I would have put that number one as well. Um, yeah. Third, the power of the Daleks, which is uh, Patrick Tretton's introductory story. Yeah. Um, a great episode, but it's you know, I think because it's missing. And it's so seminal. I think it's difficult to give a full opinion on it in terms of going back and watching it. It's a great reconstruction. If you want to get into the animated yeah. reconstructions, that is a good place to start of the recent ones. I mean, I think, again, like you said, it's very difficult to say because we can't actually watch it as it went out. Um, it, it is probably at the top of my favourite Dalek stories um, because I remember when yeah. I first listened to it, I just thought, wow, this is great. Um, and I like the animated reconstruction as well. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm I'm sort of okay seeing it up there. I think it it, mm. it deserves to be rated highly. Um, and then what about the the latter three stories? Are you sort of happy with that? Do you think they, yes, they, so those have ranked well? The bottom three: nineteenth, the underwater menace; twentieth, the dominators, and the space pirates comes in dead last. I would personally say. I think the Crotons is a worse story than the Dominators. I think the Dominators is... Do- the yeah. Dominators visually has more going for it, I think. Uh, the Crotons, I can't get past their Brummie yes. accents. Yes. Um, yeah, that is weird. That is a weird choice. It's a really odd decision. But they're supposed to be South African, I think. But they sound Brummie. <laughs> so I don't quite understand what that's, you know, what's going on there. Um, Does Roy Skelton the, the, just couldn't do that accent? <laughs> I mean, he's good at shouting. He's good at shouting. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, uh, of the stories listed there, I, I'm surprised the, the wheel in space is that low. Really? Um, I don't really rate the wheel in space. I, I've i always really liked it. I think okay. that it's better. I think it's better than the Highlanders. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily better than the Ice Warriors, but then, you know... There are some of these stories in the middle I've never been a massive fan of. Like the Macra Terra, I think yeah. is all right. The Faceless Ones, I think is definitely just okay. Um, yeah. So it probably deserves its place there. But I'd put the Wheel in Space above above the Faceless Ones, maybe because it's got the Cybermen. And I think some of those sequences with the Cybermen infiltrating the wheel are really, really good. good. Yeah, that is uh, true. And there are some really nice visual moments, like with the, the egg with the Cyberman in it and the Cybermats. Yeah. And... I think the design for the Cybermen in that story and the way they speak is really cool and creepy. Yeah. Um, so I'm surprised it's as low as that, but yeah, it hasn't been reconstructed and I think it's one of the ones that's really crying out for it. I'm sure it was probably one that will get done. Um, it feels conspicuous by his absence at the moment as the only, the only Cyberman story 
not to have a home media release in any capacity. So I'm sure it will it will come out eventually. And like you said, you know, that in itself might boost it up the ranks because people can actually watch it for, you know, what, what it is. Exactly. Uh, right, let's have a look at the third and fourth Doctors. So mm. uh, for John Pertwee is the third Doctor, my favourite Doctor. Uh, yeah. Top three, Inferno, The Green Death, and spearhead from space. No notes, Matthew. No notes at all. Um, no, I mean, Inferno is fantastic. Inferno uh, is the story that famously made me shit my pants uh, as a child. Uh, not actually, but, you know, came close. <laughs> I was um, going to say, I've never heard that version of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it is fantastic. It's the first time Doctor Who does parallel worlds and alternate realities. Um, so, well worth a watch. Um, and yeah, pretty scary as well. Um, the Green Death... And of course, they all turned around and they all had their eye patches on, of course. Of course, they uh, certainly did. Um, there's a little yeah. deep cut reference. You'll get it eventually, Doctor Who fans. You'll get it, newbies. Yeah. Uh, In 15 got- years' time, maybe you'll understand that reference. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got the Green Death, uh, the one with the maggots, um, mm-hmm. which if you're new to Doctor Who, but maybe you've got a, a relative or a parent that liked Doctor Who as a kid, maybe in the 70s. Maybe if you turn around to them and say, did you ever see the one with the maggots? Nine times out of ten, they'll probably go, yes, it friggin' terrified me. It was great. Um, for some reason, it's just one of those stories that just seeped into People the remember. consciousness of yeah. the public. Yeah, um, Brilliant story. Uh, it, it marks a big shift in the program at that time um, because a lot of characters are written out of it and just... It, yeah, it's it, it, it's really bloody good. It's good fun. Um, and then, of course, Spearhead from Space, we mentioned it earlier as a possible jumping on point for Doctor Who. It's fantastic. Doctor Who goes yeah. into colour. We've got some great monsters with the Autons and uh, introduces the, the unit family as a full-time fixture of the programme. Um, yeah, the John Pertwee era is, a, is an interesting one for Doctor Who because it's... it's unlike uh, the rest of Doctor Who, because a lot of it is set on Earth um, in the present day, or the the then present day, I should say. Um, And it features the army blowing shit up. And Doctor Who helps the army blow shit up. Which is always cool. Uh, And, you know, as a little boy, that was great. You know, I loved seeing Cybermen and Daleks getting the shit blown out of them. So, yeah. It's a very warm, nostalgic era for me. Uh, yeah. For exactly the same reasons. These were the stories that were repeated ad nauseum on, uh, you know, old classic TV channels uh, yeah. in the UK when we were growing up. For so good stories reason. like the Sea Devils, for good reason. Yeah. Uh, stories like the Sea Devils, the Mutants. I've got very fond memories of watching back then. Yeah. Speaking of, the Mutants starts our bottom three in 22nd place, the Mutants, which is a surprise for me. Yeah, because um, I, I rewatched it the other day and I really enjoy that yeah. story. I, I like it's, it. It's a good. It's a good story. It's got an interesting yeah. political sort of um, uh, nucleus to it. Yeah. Twenty uh, third place, the monster of Peladon, which I would probably agree with. Yeah, it's dog shit. That low down the list, uh, and the time monster in twenty fourth. Yeah, that that is deservedly so. That I mean, I know some people like it for its sort of camp madness, but it is a bit nonsensical in my opinion. Um, we'll do it at some point and I'll be able to understand what the fuck's going on. But um, yeah, you know, I think it just tries to do too much and yeah. it just doesn't really get a grasp on what anything, any of these concepts really are, what they mean. Um, I think what is worth saying with this one, because there are so many stories on here where you look at them and think, well, that should be higher. But then, then you see another yes. one. It's like, oh, but then that should be higher. This era has some of the best Doctor Who stories ever. I mean, John Pertwee has got a very strong run of stories, so it is very hard to place them because you've just got really good bangers facing off against each other, and it's just very hard to rank them. Really, that top 10 could, you know, as long as you've got kind of Inferno and probably the Green Death up there, any of those 10 could be in the top five. Yeah, that is very true. That is very true. Yeah. Uh, and then we move on to the most popular Doctor of the classic series. He is the David ah, Tennant of his day. My yes. favourite. Ah, my yes. Doctor. Tom. Think of Jesus. Think of uh, Jesus, the Tom Baker. Doctor, Tom Baker. Top three, City of Death, Genesis of the Daleks, and in third, your favourite, Matt, the Pyramids of Mars. Um, yeah. Again, I have no notes. 
no, I mean, all very, very good stories, all brilliant. Um, interesting, really, that City of Death came top because that is a very different tone to the other two stories. The other two stories mm. have that very doom-laden tone like you were talking about with stories like Earthshock. Um, and it feels like, oh, shit's going to go down in this story or, yes. you know, the, the, the stakes are high. Whereas City of Death is more of a, a fun runaround romp. Um, but it's just very well written. It was written by Douglas Adams, who, if you're not a Doctor Who fan, you've probably heard of him because he wrote a little thing called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, yeah, he worked on Doctor Who uh, for a couple of years. Yeah. And he wrote this banger of a story. So, um, yeah, it, very good. Uh, I'm off to Paris at the end of October. You are. I will be visiting all the locations running around with a scarf on. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 and, and, da. Annie's mum has already said, I'll film you and you can run around the streets of Paris together. Perfect. Uh, bottom three for this listing. Megalos 39. That 40, should not be the that Horns low. of Nymon. No? <laughs> Megalos should not be that low. Megalos is fine. No? I like Megalos. Yeah, it is. I, I have to say, as we were saying just there about the, the, the John Pertwee era, whereas any of those top 10 could be in the top five. Yeah. I think once you get past number 11, the brain of Morbius, I think all of those stories below, with the exception of one or two, like I really like Robot. Uh, yeah. The Sontaran Experiment. Yeah. Um, Nightmare of Eden. There's some yeah. stories down here that I really like, but I have to say the rest of them from 10 downwards, 11 downwards, I wouldn't give more than a five out of 10. And I, yeah. I think that is tricky for the fourth Doctor's era. It w went on for seven years. Yeah. And there is a point that you hit where I just feel it is treading water for a long time. Uh, I Douglas agree. Adams comes in, spices up the dialogue a bit, but you're still, you know, we're still talking about stories like, you know, the fucking Armageddon Factor and the power <laughs> of Kroll that he's involved with, you know? Armageddon Factor, Christ, Armageddon wouldn't be as bad as having to sit through that six weeks. <laughs> Can you imagine, at some point, we're going to have to do the key to time, and that's oh, going to be... Oh, my God. That, that's that, going to we'll be... We'll have a... to figure out a way of doing it without, you know, you know <laughs> we going kill to... Ourselves. Yeah, we're going to one of those places where they kill you nicely. Um, <laughs> the Horns of Nymon in 40th, I think we're probably okay yeah, with that. That's dog shit, yeah. And Underworld, uh, me memeable, 41. Very memeable, but it's poo. Uh, and yeah, and then, of course, Underworld is, um, yeah... Is crap. Awful. I, I've got uh, to say, One of our though, first ever reviews in the podcast. I've got to say, though, some of these ones are crazy. Like, The Deadly Assassin is my second favourite Doctor Who story, and mm -hmm. it's only number 10. I mean, come on. What's going on there? I think The Deadly Assassin's better than The Seeds of Doom. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I mean, Seeds of Doom is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but number six? Oh, I don't think so. Mm, I don't think so somehow. I agree. Um, yeah. Okay, let's rattle through some of these because we are nearing the end of our slot here on Pickaxe Week. Uh, we're into uh, the fifth Doctor. They've, they've, got, they've given us the slot. We, we just can't keep going. <laughs> we're the last one. Nobody yeah. else is doing anything interesting here on Twitch later on. Yeah. You're with us. I don't us. think, I don't think there's us. any other streams going on after this. Is there probably some old crap? So <laughs> come on. <laughs> some shit to do with fucking... <laughs> What is it? What, what is it you lot play these days? Bloody oh. Minecraft. Come on, it's I, not 2008. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Christ alive. Right. Uh, the Fifth Doctor. Top three yeah. stories. The Caves of Androzani, Earthshock, and Brilliant. The Five Doctors. No I wouldn't notes. put it in the top three. The Five Doctors? No, I wouldn't put that in the top three. What I would, would be have gone, I would have, I would have gone for Kinder, which Kinder. was fourth. Yeah. Just because, I mean, Five Doctors is great. Uh, it's, it's a great story. But I always feel a bit funny because it's like, well, it's not really a Peter Davison story because he doesn't really have much to do because all the other doctors get all the, the grunt work. That's that's true. I have to say that that's one of the reasons I like it. I know, you know, I'm not yeah. a massive fifth <laughs> yeah, doctor Davison's fan. Barely in it. <laughs> He's barely in it. All the other doctors overshadow him massively. But I have to say, you watch it and you go, do you know what? Compared to everybody else here, you haven't got the conviction of these other actors in this yeah. role. I'm sorry. I'm putting my hands up. I am a hater. I, you know, you are the wet vet. That's it. Nobody else can eat a slice of pineapple like Richard Hurdle. No one else eat pussy like that. Uh, no. Right. And then the I'm bottom sure his three. His wife was very happy. <laughs> 
if indeed he was married. I don't know. <laughs> the bottom three, 18, the King's Demons, 19th, Warriors of the Deep, and 20th, we only reviewed it a couple of weeks ago, Matt, it's Time Flight. Yeah. Um, I think I would put King's Demons below Warriors of the Deep. I wow. think I prefer Warriors of the Deep, just because it's got Silurians and Sea Devils in it, and the story makes more sense. The only benefit yeah. of the King's Demons is that it's only two episodes long, so... That you know, is a major <laughs> relief. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, it's sort of like, you know, apples and pears, isn't it, really? You can't really... There, there's not much in it. Um, but yeah, honestly, I think that that's a fair old ranking. Um, n- there's nothing really on this list. Oh, Black Orchid is at 13. That should be much higher. Black Orchid is much better than The Awakening. What and is that I would about? say Frontius is better than Mordrin Undead. I don't know why that's so high. Yeah, Mordrin Undead is weirdly high. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think to be honest, having a lot of those stories released in box sets Planet- was probably quite useful. Why is Planet of Fire 14? That is dog shit. Wow. Terminus is very low as well. Yeah. A Planet of Fire does not deserve to be that high. Arc of Infinity is better than Planet of Fire. Big time. I mean, the only thing that Planet of Fire has got for it, there's two, it. Th- it's two things. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't say it. Leave it to people's imagination. I think they know what you're talking about. Okay. Just Google Planet of Fire and see if you can find the two things I'm talking about. Anyway. But they are um, both magnificent. Right, the yeah. Sixth Doctor, top three, <laughs> Revelation of the Daleks, Vengeance yeah. on Varos, and the Two Doctors. <laughs> Um, I'm, getting I, told, uh, I, I'm getting told off it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, she knows it's true. Um, right. So yeah, Revelation, Revelation of the Daleks, Daleks yeah, Vengeance on Varos, and the Two Doctors. Uh, I am very interested that the Two Doctors has been given such a uh, help up the rankings, probably by having uh, Patrick Trouton in it. Yeah. Because um, it's kind of cool, but it's... Uh, the trouble is, I mean, we've only got eight stories to rank from if you take away the fact that Trial of a Time Lord is made up of four individual stories and it is a whole yeah. season. Yeah. Um, but based on that, what do you think? I mean, I think Revel- Revelation's in the right place. I think that probably yeah. is the best story of his era. Um, I do like Vengeance on Varos. I don't know if I'd put Two Doctors at number three, though. I think no. I'd go for something like Attack of the Cybermen. Um, okay. I mean, obviously... Two Doctors is lovely. Like you said, it's got Patrick Troughton in, which is lovely to see him back and Fraser Hines and Sontarans and stuff. But it's one of those stories that it's a bit too long and there's not enough story yeah. to fill the the three episode slot because these are three 45 minute episodes. So, you know, it's basically a six parter um, and it, it, it feels like it. Sometimes it feels like a bit of a slog. Uh, bottom three, Attack of the Cybermen. Time Lash and The Twin Dilemma. Again, I think Attack of the Cybermen should be higher. I've yeah. never got into the Mark of the Rani. I think that, that the, the bottom three should be Mark of the Rani, Time Lash, and The Twin Dilemma, myself. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I mean, I, d- I don't dislike Mark of the Rani, but again, it's not really got much of a plot. It's a not particularly. Bit, it's a bit wish-wash, wishy-washy. Um, time Lash, yeah, crap. Although I didn't mind it last time I watched it, I must say. And then Twin Dilemma. I mean, we've also talked about that uh, one of the very first episodes of, the, of this podcast, um, if you it want was. to go back and listen to that. Um, but like you said, not many stories to really go no. from, to be honest. I think that's so it, why, it's hard. I, I, and I think we'll talk about it in just a second when we come to the Jodie Whittaker era. Yeah. I think it's really disappointing the way that I understand it was released as under one umbrella, but I think yeah. for the benefit of Colin and the fact that one of those stories does actually stand entirely alone as an adventure, uh, yeah. with the exception of some of the trial sequences being yeah. uh, Terror of the Vervoids, I think it's worth including the Mysterious Planet and because <clears throat> t- Mind Warp is up there in terms yeah. of Colin Baker stories. It is yeah. so good. Yeah, um, I you know that could be top three because I I don't really like the two doctors, so I probably put Mind Warp as my third ever favorite. But because it's yeah. part of the Trial of a Time Lord, it doesn't get ranked in that way. Yeah, I I, I agree, and I think it 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 well, it's going to show even more when we come to the Thirteenth Doctor stuff, where mm. it yeah, that it that was that was a weird choice, I think. Um, but let, let's move on to Sylvester McCoy. 
Yeah. Uh, so top Doc- three, Remembrance of the Daleks, The Curse yeah. of Fenric, and Survival. Yeah. Um, all good. All very good. I don't know if I'd put Survival at number three. Nope. Um, I think I might go for something like uh, British in the Galaxy or Happiness Patrol, yeah. perhaps. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I think, again, we run into this problem where there's a lot of good stories there mm. and it's hard to necessarily rank them. Like the obvious ones are at the top. Yeah. Remembrance and Femric. Um, and then, of course, at the bottom, we've got Paradise Towers at number 10. At 11, we've got Delta and the Bannerman. And then at number 12, we've got Time and the Rani. I think that's insane. I think though, though that order is completely cockeyed. I think par- right. Paradise, to- Paradise Towers needs to go at the bottom. Yeah. Then Time of the Rani above that. And then above that, we've got Delta and the Bannerman. I like Delta and the Bannerman. It's good fun. I think, I think the right three stories are in there. But as you say, I think the order's a bit off. Um, yeah. I think Time and the Rani is... I think we, we I think we should go and do that at some point because it is a regeneration yeah. story, but it's definitely one of the weakest. Yes. Um, but it's it's got a charm to it that I don't really get from Delta and the Bannerman and Paradise Towers is you know it's a a guilty pleasure favorite of mine because I've got yeah. very fond memories of watching it as a kid. But I agree, it isn't in the pantheon of Doctor Who is a great story. No. So it probably deserves to be at the bottom of that list in particular, yeah. I would agree. Um, okay, so obviously the Eighth Doctor, conspicuous by his absence from this list because there is only one Eighth Doctor story uh, on screen being yeah. the TV movie. So yeah. we're going to go straight to the Ninth Doctor. Top three, <clears throat> The Empty Child, The Doctor Dances. That's the one with the gas mask. Uh, yeah. The Bad Wolf, Parting of the Ways in number two. And third, Dalek. Uh, yeah. I would personally put that finale first. I would uh, maybe have Dalek second and uh, right. Empty Child third. Um, um, a great story, but I, I just prefer the Dalek stories in that series. I think I would just swap two and three. I think Dalek... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I love the Empty Child. Then again, does Dalek go top? It, it's again another one of these issues where it's a fairly strong season. You, there's only a Very few sort so. of shitty ones. I mean, th- the bottom three are Boomtown, Aliens of London, World War Three, and then the Long Game, um, which I think is again the right three to be at the bottom. Um, mm-hmm. I think I would put Boomtown below Aliens yes, of London. I agree. I agree. I, I, I prefer Aliens of London, generally speaking. Um, I mean, I'm a bit disappointed that something like The Unquiet Dead is as low as it is, because I love that story. Um, I mean, Rose is great, but I think The Unquiet Dead yeah. is a better sort of... It, Rose is very good because obviously it introduces Doctor Who in such a good way, whereas I think The Unquiet Dead is just, generally speaking, a better all-around Doctor Who story. Yes, I uh, I like the Unquiet Dead. The, those first three stories, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rose End of the World and Unquiet Dead, yeah, are actually, you know, as we were saying earlier, a lot of people said that's a great introduction. Those three are a great intro to the show in terms of, yeah, you know, intro, present day, going forward in time, going back in time, and that is a really nice um, formula that works for the show. Is introducing those three stories right from the start with a new companion. Yeah. And um it it gets used again that formula later on down the line. Yeah. I uh I like the Unquiet Dead, but it's a bit more of a run around. I and you know so is the end of the world. Yeah. Um I'm I'm generally pretty pretty happy with that whole ranking I have to say of yeah. all those stories. I, I don't I don't think looking at it nothing's really changed compared to previous years. So no. but I, no, I, no. And I think you know it's it's pretty fair. Um right then. Over to the man himself, David DT. Tennant. The David big, the big, Tenninch. The big man, yeah. Coming in um, at number one, of course, is Blink. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't going to be anything else. No. Uh, and I think probably deserves its place as the best 10th Doctor story. Um, I don't know what that says about him not being in it that much. But <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, second, Human Nature Family of Blood. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and Silence in the Library, Forest of the Dead, uh, which is a good two-parter. I prefer Turn Left, personally. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, right. I like The Waters of Mars. Watching yeah. it for the podcast not long ago, I have to say, it's gone down a little bit in my estimations. Okay. Um, but I don't know if it's sixth level. Uh, but then Turn Left is there, and that's so good. Midnight's so good. I, 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 we've talked about this before, about Turn Left, and I always sort of forget Turn Left exists. So I don't know what mm. that says about me as a fan. So maybe that's one that we need to do at some point so I can some point reappraise soon, yeah. it. Um, but I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised that... I mean, like Silence in the Library is fine, but personally, I would have put Midnight above it because I think Midnight is just genius, really, um, in as much as that, you know, it was like written in a weekend or whatever. And I mean, it, that is it, amazing, yeah. It, it makes so much of the limitations of that of the budget or and stuff it's great yeah and, it's, and that's it's something Doctor Who does really well is when yeah. it's got its back against the wall and it can only make a monster out of sticky back plastic and some string it yeah. usually smashes it out of the park you know because it's yeah it's about a bit more than that uh yeah. and, and and Doctor Who can usually get by having a very very shoestring budget and being able to do things on the cheap um, yeah and I think it really does come into its own when it's put into situations like that and you get a story like Midnight which is just one of the best bits yeah. of drama of the last you know sort of 20 years on tv yeah because um, it's like how can we make this scary without having you know we can't afford a monster but we need a monster yeah. you know yeah. how can we uh, you know how can we do it so yeah it, it's great um and uh, again like, having like a, look, said, like, a little bit go on i was gonna say like even something like waters of mars i'm surprised that that's as low down um mm. but it, but it's interesting to see for his in particular there are a lot of Swaps and changes. Lots have gone up and down all over the place. School reunion. I'm baffled to see it number 10. Yeah. I think that could uh, go higher. Yeah. I know it's got Sarah Jane and, and K9 in it, but I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that that's there. Utopia, the sound of drums, last of the time Lords, I think is a fantastic finale. Yeah. Um, I would put it personally above the stolen earth and journey's end, but yeah. stolen earth and journey's end is, very much as we said with the five doctors, it's a bit like an Avengers get together with That's all the it. cast members from that run yeah. of the show coming back together. Yeah. So I can understand why it's there. Yeah. Um, and especially if that is your era, then that is like yeah. catnip to you. I mean, it's a bit different for us because we were, you know, funny teenagers at that point, I guess. Um, I, it, you know, the, the significance of it wasn't, it was a bit wasted on me, I guess. Smith and Jones at 16. I think that's way too high. Um, the Christmas Invasion yeah. is a great bit of telly. Planet yeah. Ud, we only watched that the other week. That's fantastic. That Gridlock, I think that is fantastic. That's the Runaway really Bride, good. I think is grand. It's probably yeah. on the same level as Smith and Jones. So yeah. I would probably just bring Smith and Jones down a little bit around the Runaway Bride, around that sort yeah. of. I mean, uh, look at like forty two, which we reviewed not long yeah, ago, and we really so low enjoyed down. it. 31? Nah, come on. 31 that's, out of 36. That's crazy. You know, that, the bottom that needs three to be much higher. Uh, are Love and Monsters, uh, 34. The Lazarus yeah. Experiment, 35. That and is... Fear Her, 36. The Lazarus Experiment, I love. I think that's a great story. I mean, all right, it's not like one of the best, but 35? Yeah. Come on. There's some I more know. shit ones than that in here. A Planet of the Dead does not deserve to be The 32. Doctor's Daughter. The Doctor's Daughter, yeah. Lazarus Experiment is much better. That's almost a whole 10 places above the Lazarus Experiment. That's crazy. But, it is you know. nuts. Um, um, yeah. And also, I mean, I, I, I think for the rest of them, that's it's pretty much as yeah. you expect. I mean, I, I really, I think the Fires of Pompeii and School Reunion yeah. should have a swap. Yeah. Uh, I think that I think the Fires of Pompeii should be much higher. Partners yeah. in Crime as well is fine. Uh, I'm surprised Elsie, I didn't like the that. time. No, no, yeah, but I see. I'd have it. I'd have it lower than where it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, there's no way it should be above gridlock. And no. the end of time. What do you think is as David Tennant's last story? Is it about right there or? Don't know. Maybe. Let me looking at the. Mm, I, I maybe I'd put it a bit lower. I'm not. I haven't seen it for a long time, it. but I, no, I've I not watched it in Yonks. Yeah. Um, okay, then, the 11th Doctor, top three. Yeah. Now, this is where we get into some interesting territory because when we did our first <laughs> kind of chat about 
ranking Doctor Who stories, it was with the 50th anniversary poll. The day of yeah. the Doctor, the 50th anniversary special had just come out and it topped yeah. the poll. Um, and here it is at the top of the 11th Doctor's rankings still, the yeah. day of the Doctor. Yeah. Um, what do we think of that now? I still wouldn't put it there. I, I still think there are better stories. Um, I don't know what I don't know what I put there, but I think there's better ones. Um, yeah, I mean, Vincent and the Doctors at number two, which is great. Eleventh yeah. Hours at number three, which is also really good. Um, I don't know. This one is a really hard one for me because and I'm sure it's a difficult one for you as well because it's not an era that we are particularly fond of and it's not one that we've particularly gone back to a lot because we're not fond of it. Um, yeah, but I mean... I, I, I think that the top 10 is probably about right because I look at everything below the top 10 yeah. and, again, I find very middling. The Asylum of the yeah, Daleks agree. should not be... 17th that needs to be much lower much lower yeah um, for sure and i wouldn't put a below, good man goes to war that high i don't like that no particularly much um, no um I, I mean i'm quite happy to see some of the 7b ones have cracked out yeah. of the top half but then yeah. let's have a look at the bottom three i mean Curse the snowman the should be 13 no no chance and then oh, and, the bells and, of saint john is way better than that yeah, and let's kill Hitler at number thirty. That should be right down because that is mm. horse manure. <laughs> let's talk about the horse manure that they've ranked here. Uh, Thirty-seven, the curse of the black spot. I'd say yeah. about right. I thought that was rubbish. Uh, yeah. Thirty-eight, nightmare in silver, absolutely. And thirty-ninth, yeah. the doctor, the widow, in the wardrobe. Yes, I, uh, I, I think those are all fair, but I still think I'd put let's kill Hitler. At least Lower. 38, yeah, because this this dog shit. All right, let me You're just up, open the schedule up. Update uh, the spreadsheet, yeah, put that fucking yeah. crap on there. <laughs> turn left is in ah. there, so we've got we've got turn left coming up soon. So at least you've got okay. that before we have to worry about doing Let's Kill Hitler a bit later down the line. Right, right, right. Um, okay, uh, let's have a look at the 12th Doctor now, because now this yeah. is interesting, because this is the first time yeah. the 12th and 13th Doctors have been ranked in DWM in this way. This is the first time we've seen a fan consensus presented in this way that yeah. isn't just a Twitter poll or somebody stating their opinion as facts on the internet. Yeah. So let's have a look. Like us. This. <laughs> like us, assholes. So top three. Yeah. Number one, World Enough and Time, The Doctor Falls, uh, Heaven Sent, and Mummy on yeah. the Orient Express. Good with all those. I mean, I am, but I don't know if I'd put Mummy on the... Mummy on the Orient Express is fine. I don't know if I'd put it that high. I thought you really loved it. No, I like it, but I don't know if I'd go that high. I think I'd put Flatline we above it. Yeah, I thought you'd say that. I I'm very I like happy that. to see Oxygen in the top five, because I love yeah, Oxygen. I need to re... Yeah, me too. I I'd die without it. Um... It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> one, one that I need to rewatch. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, um, it's, no, it's very, it, was, it was great. This I'm glad one you did is it. another difficult one because. Thank you. Um, this is another difficult one because, again, it's not an era that we're like particularly into. I would yeah. say that certain stories like. Um, Empress of Mars. I mean, I always sing that story's praises. I think yeah. that should be higher. I also think Into the Dalek, uh, yeah. which is beneath it. So that's 24 and 25. I don't mind Into the Dalek. I think it's fine. It's probably the better Dalek story that Peter Capaldi had. So I think that could be higher, particularly when you've got stuff like number 11, Face the Raven. <laughs> nah. Uh, I know. No uh, way. I'm also having a look at number 12 here. Listen. That yeah, needs to be higher. Yeah. There is no way that the Husbands of River Song... You think that needs to be higher? Listen. Husbands of River Song is above listen. Can we at least agree that that needs to get swapped? Husbands of River Song should be right on the fucking bottom. I, and it's <laughs> fucking, it's in the top 10. But I don't think, I don't think listen, li listen shouldn't be a top 10 story. No? Okay. No, nah, no, not at all. Um, I don't think Face the Raven should be up there. Husbands of River Song, definitely not. Um... Oh, and that bastard Zygon story? Nah. <laughs> Feck that. That ain't seven. No way. Ah, <laughs> oh, God, no. I mean, uh. I, don't know, I don't know if the target novelization makes up for some of the television de decisions, 
Perhaps it does. But it made it, it made Frank Skinner cry. Do you remember that? He didn't say was cry, on... cry. How how it made him cry? <laughs> it made me cry as well, Frank. <laughs> um, okay, despair. let's have a look at the bottom three. <laughs> uh, Thirty three, sleep no more. Thirty four, kill the moon. Thirty five, in the forest of the night. I would agree with all those. Nah, eaters of shite could probably be a bit lower. Yeah, and I think the I return think, of Doctor Mysterio. Yeah, that could be lower. The woman who lived. I think I'd sooner watch Sleep No More than the woman who lived. Yeah, true. I I've rewatched Sleep No More, and in hindsight, it's not that bad. The thing that yeah. cocks that story up is that they tried to do the weird gimmick. I think had they have just yeah. done it as a plain story, it probably would have been better. I think the mm. the gimmick of it Being makes found it. Footage. The found footage, that's it. I couldn't think of what it was called. Um, the found footage element makes it somewhat impenetrable, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. And it confuses the story, needlessly so. Um, so I actually think that's not as bad as people think it is. But yeah, I mean, especially compared to bloody The Woman Who Lived. Any of yeah. that one, like The Woman Who Lived. The Girl Who Died is 27. I mean, yeah. that's pretty crap. Robots of Sherwood, Robot of Sherwood, I quite enjoy that. That's a fun mm. little story. That should not be anywhere near as low. No, I think I think people are taking liberties with that one because it is a bit lighter. Yeah. Uh, but it's a better story, you know, just because it's a bit lighter yeah. and it's not dealing with, you know, a, a particularly meaty subject or a particularly, yeah. you know, evocative uh, setup or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I think... I think those sto- those kinds of stories are definitely going to creep up the the further yeah. away we get from them. Yeah, um, Robert sure. Sherwood will, will will certainly pop up these rankings as we go. And then finally, yeah. the Thirteenth Doctor, the most recent era of the program, as played by Jodie Whittaker. It was yeah. such a contentious era of the program. Yeah, uh, so many people find so many faults with it. Some of them entirely justified. Others down to racism, homophobia, and other such phobias, mm. uh, but not all, not all the time. Uh, yeah. So let's have a look at some of this. So number one, power of the Doctor. No way. That's the most no recent story. Way. No way. It was the centenary she's special. It, it was Jodie's farewell, and she's barely in it. Um, yeah. It is. Uh, I love the way you described it as it was like a child had eaten a load of sweets and been sick. Yeah. Uh, it because it that I mean, it's not an anniversary. It, it's kind of like an anniversary special in the worst way that you could view an anniversary special, like bringing people back seemingly for the sake of it. Yeah. Uh, there's no real coherence with the story whatsoever. No. Um It's just a series of things happening, and then Jodie Whittaker regenerates into David Tennant at the end. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. With it's- the window dressing of having old actors come back to play parts when it, they, there's no need for them to be there, really. Yeah, that's it. You know, the, it, it's, you're right. It was lovely to see Tegan and Ace come back, but they felt sort of pointless to the story. Early. There was no yeah. real need for them to be there. You know, you compare that to School Reunion where Sarah Jane comes back and it makes mm. such a big, you know, not only is it nostalgia and lovely to see her, but it's a massive story point for Rose because she gets yeah. to see the woman she could very well end up becoming and what life Absolutely. is like for her. But you don't really get that here. You know, Yaz doesn't have that moment of like, oh, you know, Doctor, I really love you, but you, you're you going to leave me behind and I'm going to be doing yeah. whatever this, these two do. It's missing scenes like that for it yeah. to be, you know, and, and and as much as I love the song, probably could have done without the Rasputin dance yeah, and had a scene crap. with the Doctor and Yaz having that kind of a discussion. Yeah. Uh, but obviously it wasn't high on the list of priorities. Number two, The Haunting of Villa Diodati. Uh, yeah, brilliant. I mean, yeah, excellent, fantastic yeah. story. Yeah. Probably the most atmospheric of the Jodie Whittaker stories. Definitely, um, yeah. Although there's one that's quite low on this list that I would also say is pretty good in terms of atmosphere, which would be Resolution. I really like that story. Oh, God, um, No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I love you're shaking your head. No, no, no. I love no. that story. As soon as you get into the cafe with Ryan and his dad, Dad. Oh what yeah, been, what I have know. you been doing? Have you been? Have you been on the oil rigs? No, son. I've been selling microwaves, and I'm going to use it to try and blow up a Dalek <laughs> later on. I 
God almighty. It's like, this is boring bullshit. I don't care. But, oh, shit. My take, I don't my care chair about Ryan. He's a, he is a non-entity of a companion. He is a vacuous void of a companion. <laughs> that might be true, but the Dalek <laughs> stuff in it is fucking great. I mean, yeah, I don't mind the Dalek stuff. I got to say, I, I, I quite like the mutant thing and like the attaching it to, to the girl and all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, I, I mean, the design uh, I'm of the, the final Dalek, you know, I, I, I've aired my criticisms about that. And I know, you know, plot wise, it makes sense, but it still looks like shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was looking Good at toy, photos though. of the Daleks. Good toy. Good it's toy. It's a great toy. Um, yeah. I was looking at them as they eventually appear in Revolution, that design. Yeah. We see it in its full glory. Yeah. And I was looking at it and I thought, I admire them for doing it. I really do. And to have another design of Dalek when you've got the bronze one sitting there and they are really yeah. the peak of that kind yeah. of a design. This is it. To go, do you know what? Let's do something different. And they do something different. It doesn't look as good. But no. it, it, it's a worthy addition, I think. Just yeah. to have something different. I think they look grand, you know? Okay. Um, okay. And then third, the, uh, Fugitive of the Jadoon again. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Now, yeah. I I think that's very good. Now, it had Flux, which was obviously the six-part story yeah. made up of other stories. Had that not have been treated in this poll the way that it has as one story, which I think is a bit wrong... Because I don't yep. think it is the same as like Trial of a Time Lord. It you isn't. Know. It isn't. Y- you know, um, I would have put Village of the Angels up there. Yeah. Um, that that probably would have been my number two, and then yep. Fugitive of the, of the Jadoon would have been three. But <clears> unfortunately, <throat> the poll didn't work this way, um, which is a bit bonkers. It's mad. I, I think yeah. that's. I think that's terrible because Flux is a subtitle. You know. Yeah. Like you didn't get. You know. The, the, I can understand why they might have done it with Trial of a Time Lord because it's Trial of a Time Lord part 1 to, f- to 14 in the credits. That's how yeah. it's presented. Yeah. But it's not done as Flux episode 1, Flux episode 2. They no. they're split into chapters, but they've all yeah. got their own individual. So if you want to maybe you have to include the chapters, chapter 1, yeah. chapter 2 in the listing. But they uh, it, it, it is a I'd love to hear their reasoning for that. Um, yeah. Because it is weird. not the same thing as Trial of a Time Lord. No, because it it feels Flux feels more like a story arc in the same way as Bad Wolf or yes. something like that. Um, perhaps slightly more on the nose, um, but yeah, I don't think it requires. I think you could easily watch Village of the Angels and sort of ignore the sh- the the Fluxy Absolutely. stuff around it. Um, I don't know. And it's, it's a, it's a stories weird Stories like War of the Sontarans, that was great. Yeah, that was really um, good. That would be up there for me. I, I, I'd i have absolutely. that as like number four or something. I really enjoyed yeah. that. Uh, and then the bottom three. Let's have a look at the bottom three for this. So Legend of the Sea Devils, 22. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Uh, 23, The Battle of Ranscor of Colos. Uh, and also Orphan 55. Yeah. Excuse me, right at the bottom in 24th. And I would agree with all those. Do you think I maybe might put Orphan 55 slightly above Franz Korof Kolos? I think he's got more of a story. Franz Korof Kolos just feels like... It does. Nothing's really going on here. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. As, as, as a season finale, I think it fails hugely. I, 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 I do wonder at some point if we'll find out that Resolution... Like maybe the airing of yeah. the ball was supposed to be a lot closer together and that it was, maybe. you know, resolution is the... definitely marketed as a New Year's Day special. Yeah. But I wonder if the show was supposed to maybe roll into it straight into that story because yeah. there was a bit too much of a break for it to be seen as directly, you know, related to that season. It felt like a separate special, didn't it? Yeah. Yes, it did. Um, and I think, ha- yeah, had that have been the season finale, it would have worked a lot better um, yeah. but that also just thinking about that story, it goes back to that point that you made earlier about what Chibnall was saying in that podcast. Mm. You know, this is one of those instances where the ball was sort of dropped because they kept the Dalek a secret and yeah. they, you know, put ex- literally extras 
that were in the story for all of about 10 seconds, less yeah, than that. Yeah, on the front cover. On on the front cover, on the poster. And it was like, but everyone knew, everyone knew that there was a Dalek in it. And you're like, well, why mm. don't you lead with the fact that this is your new doctor meeting her greatest enemy for the first time? You know, people might have came in and actually watched it if they knew that it, the Daleks it, like were going to turn up. Would have been, that would have been Radio Time's front cover. Exactly, and yeah. people would have watched it, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. More yeah. people would have watched it, and there's nothing wrong with your audience knowing, like, come on, the Daleks are in it every year. Yeah. Like, and now finally it's the first female Doctor in her first ever Dalek story. And yeah. And nobody knows. Now, yeah. I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I know you don't like Revolution of the Daleks so much. I'm glad that Eve of the Daleks is in the top 10. I right. would personally I, I like have it. I like Revolution. You like Revolution? Revo- okay. Revolution, I, I, I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. I would personally put Eve above Spyfall. Um, yes, yes. And I would, I, I would also say, although I like the woman who fell to Earth, I think Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror is good fun. Yeah, I um, prefer that as a story. And the Witchfinders is also oh, yeah. good fun. Witchfinders, I'd put up there because I really enjoy that. The end's a bit iffy, but the actual everything else is is quite good. It, that was a sort of a breath of I, fresh I also air during think that season. That one climber that I can see. Uh, you know, as we go through in, into the future and have further polls, I can say I think the ghost monument is going to be coming a lot higher in these polls. Do you think? Um, yeah, because I think as as a standalone, I think it's a really nice story. I, I know it doesn't have a lot of plot to it, but yeah. it's basically, you know, they just have to find the TARDIS at the end and that's it. And yeah. I think for a story that kind of, impresses the importance of the TARDIS and its kind of central part in, you know, as a piece in the show. There aren't many stories that place the TARDIS with that level of importance in the story. No, um, I guess not. You know, when we have something like Journey to the Center of the TARDIS, it yeah. kind of is selling itself on that concept and doesn't really do quite enough to make it, to mm. justify its title, you know? Right. But yeah, the Ghost Monument, I think, is a better story about the TARDIS than than that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> even for that payoff at the end with the with the lovely sweeping oh, yeah. shots of the TARDIS on the hill and Stunning. all that oh, stuff yeah. and the music swells. It's just fantastic, that whole sequence. It's brilliant. Um, okay, then. Well, there we go. Interesting. We've probably certainly gone over our allotted time here, but we've had a lot yeah. of fun talking about Doctor Who <laughs> yeah. and trying to introduce you all to the mad concepts involved in watching this programme. Um, if you've enjoyed uh, listening to us rabbit on, we are available in all the regular podcasting places yeah. uh, every fortnight talking about Doctor Who, old, new, uh, and what's to come. Uh, yeah. And we also have a Patreon account. Uh, if you pledge to that, then you get the show every week. But we'll take a slight diversion and talk about some of the minutiae of Doctor Who, for example. Doctor Who audio dramas, Doctor Who spin-offs. We do Q&As and stuff over there as well. It's a good time, so make sure you go and check that out. Yeah, and just to say thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to Pickaxe for organising Pickaxe Week and having us on here. Uh, Tomorrow at five o'clock, it's One Life Left. And then from 6.30, it's Pitch Please. So definitely come back tomorrow and check those guys out. Um, But for now, uh, we'll sign off and see you hopefully on our usual spots on the internet. And hopefully this has been informative and you are now all card-carrying sad Doctor Who fans. Like like (laughs) us, yeah. Um, So we'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.